Okay. Time's got just gone six o'clock uh, UK time. So welcome to the Second World War Research Group's D-Day 80 event, um, generously hosted by King's College London School of Security Studies. Uh, I'm Dr. Alex Wilson, um, lecturer in uh, strategic studies here at King's. And it's my privilege to welcome today, um, Dr. Halleck Kachansky, um, doctor and also captain, Arthur W. Gulickson, and Nick Hewitt um, to speak on the Normandy campaign. Um, you'll have seen from uh, all over the BBC, The Guardian, the Daily Mail, other news outlets, um, that there are dozens of D-Day 80 events um, conducted in the UK, France and around the world. Uh, and many of these are really high value. Um, but I, I think one thing that stands out about ours is that they're not just telling us familiar stories or bringing us new sources. Uh, all three of our contributors bring us fresh analysis and insights from books they've published recently over the last two years on the Normandy campaign. Um, Halleck has changed our understanding of the French resistance. Um, Nick has um, really changed our understanding of the maritime campaign, um, reimagining it as the Battle of the Seine Bay. And Arthur brings us some really compelling insights about um, the campaign in the land domain, um, including um, some insights into misinterpretations of, of German approaches to defence and how elements of the Waffen-SS have been written out of the Anglophone narrative. So I think we're in for a treat. Um, certainly we're in for something new on what has been quite a well-told story. Um, so what I intend to do is to introduce each of our panellists in turn who will give our contributions. Um, so uh, the first up is Dr. Halleck Kachansky. Uh, she's a British historian, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, and she's taught history at several universities and has written a number of acclaimed books, including Scarnet Wolseley, A Victorian Hero, The Eagle Unbowed, Poland and the Poles in the Second World War, and most recently Resistance, The Underground War in Europe, 1939 to 1945. And Resistance was the winner of the 2023 Wolfson History Prize. Halleck's now working on a new project on British citizens marooned on the continent at the outbreak of the Second World War, which will be published by Bloomsbury. Um, so, Halleck, looking forward to it. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Um, now, it's all too easy now when we are focusing on Normandy 80 years on to think of it as Normandy because we know that on the 6th of June, that is where the Allies landed. But with what I'm dealing with, with the French resistance and the German response to it, is that both parties knew that the Allies would land somewhere in northern France in the summer of 1944, but they did not know where. And this made it very challenging. Um, the German presence in northern France particularly on the coast right around the Atlantic Wall, was extremely intense um, in that there were a huge number of troops there. And this limited the gathering of intelligence and the creation of resistance groups there. It was also a very dangerous area because of Allied air attacks. In fact, there was jokes made that the only people travelling on the French railways in the months immediately prior to the invasion were the Germans and SOE agents. Yet intelligence gathering continued. Um, the whole area was being mapped and photographed frequently from the air, but there were certain things that only the resistance on the ground could find out. These were included stuff like the identity of troop formations, which were often discovered by chatting to locals who'd had them billeted on them, or using contacts in local laundries to identify unit numbers. 
this is how the resistance found out the, that Panzer had arrived in northern France ahead of air reconnaissance. It was also impossible from the air to identify which fields had been mined. But as the resistance discovered, that information could be deduced from the records in the local tax office, which recorded which fields could be used by farmers and which could not. But undoubtedly, the most vital contribution made by the agents of the Alliance Network, which reported directly to SIS, was the supply of a 55 foot long map showing every German gun and beach obstacle, as well as the location of German troops and the roads along the coast from the mouth of the river Dives in Normandy to the Cotentin Peninsula. Much of this information was supplied by Robert Duin, who was a sculptor who'd worked on many of the local churches, and he had permission to go up the church towers to see the state of the churches, and he'd spent the time mapping what he could see. Um, the resulting map was then wrapped round some volunteer um, who was then bundled onto a Lysander and flown to London in, on the 16th of March. And it proved absolutely invaluable for mapping the area for the Allies. But it was also extremely costly because over the next few months, the Germans arrested 20 mem of the men who contributed to the map, including Robert Duan, and they were all executed in Corn Prison the day after D-Day along with around 60 other agents who'd been caught in the area. And this, these arrests effectively neutralised Alliance as an intelligence gathering network in, in Normandy. Um, similar arrests took place in other groups, um, such as CND um, and the OCM, uh, largely due to betrayals or arrests in the months immediately before D-Day. Nor was SOE in any better state. The fallout from the catas catastrophic collapse of the Prosper Network in the summer of 1943 continued to be felt right into 1944. F-sections just simply could not believe the scale of the damage and was convinced that sub-circuits such as Butler and Fono were still working normally, whereas in fact their radio operators had been captured, the codes were now being played back, messages were being received, and various veteran agents were parachuted into northern France, straight into the German hands. Most of those were shipped to Germany and very few came back. <laughs> Another circuit, Donkeyman, um, was run by Henri Fraga, again with a long pedigree for resistance but it had been penetrated and he did not realize that this chummy, allegedly anti-Nazi German, Hugo Bleicher, uh, who befriended him, was actually a true German and was most put out when he was arrested by Bleicher in July, 1944. But that limited that. However, Claude de Bysac, um, a veteran of operations around the Bordeaux region, uh, returned to France in February 1944 to set up scientist Mark II um, in Normandy. But he reported that the secret army is so secret, I can't find it. So he had to start from scratch, and he did manage to build up a sort of maquis in some of the Normandy forests and to get weapons and explosives parachuted to them. However, SOE south of the old demarcation line was in far better shape um, and ready to rise up against the Germans as soon as they received the order. The paramount necessity for extreme secrecy regarding the timing and location of the landings meant that not only was the French resistance left in the dark, but so were de, de Gaulle's notoriously leaky headquarters. And this hampered French plans for instructions to pass on to the resistance. Um, the, the FFI had been, in theory, unified at the beginning of the year with General Koenig 
um, appointed as its commander. Um, the FFI being uniting all the different resistance groups. They drew up, the, the Koenig's headquarters drew up four plans to be put into operation. Plan Tortu was to prevent German formations moving by road, um, especially tank divisions from the south and not reaching the landing area. Plan Ver was to cut the railway lines leading north. Plan Violet targeted German telephone and telegraph communications. And that was important because th that would mean the Germans would have to communicate um, by radio, which of course was being eave eavesdropped by the Allies and decoded. And Plan Bleu targeted the electricity supplies to the major cities. But Koenig was, did not have a free hand. Um, he reported to Special Forces headquarters, but he got his directives from them directly from Schaeff. And Schaeff was acutely aware of the vulnerability of the first form Allied formations landing in Normandy. And so it decided that rather than follow the French plan of calling out networks in the area and gradually as the Allies moved ahead of them, Schaeff decided that they would call out the entire French resistance. So at 21.45 on the 5th of June, the BBC French service broadcast a lengthy series of over 300 personal messages to all 51 SO, SOE circuits and all 12 regional FFI commanders, warning them that the Allies would be landing the, on the following day. They still didn't tell them where. The result of those messages was an upsurge in attacks on the roads and on the railways um, to prevent the Germans from moving. There were also attempts to liberate certain areas by themselves. By the 10th of June, Koenig was so frightened by what was going on that he ordered put a maximum check on guerrilla activity. Impossible now to resupply you with arms and munitions in sufficient quantities. Break contact everywhere as much as possible to allow reorganization. Avoid large assemblies. Form isolated groups. It was too late. The genie was out of the bottle. What Koenig, as a regular army officer, did not understand is that a secret army, once it comes out into the open, it is no longer secret. France was full of collaborators. It had a special police force, the, the milice, that would target the resistance. Once out in the open, they had to stay out in the open. So what I conclude in my book is that no one was really in command. The French resistance just continued to work locally. In general, the, the resistance activity was fairly quiet in Normandy because of the high German presence and also because of the dangers presented by Allied air attack. But um, Tobiasek had managed to form a network of almost 2,000 men who set about ambushing the German convoys in the forests and in the dreaded sunken roads of Normandy. Um, but another Mackey that had been organised by the SOE headmaster circuit in the forest of Sharni near Le Mans was betrayed and the Germans attacked. In general, the, the resistance was very ac active um, yes, it did hamper uh, movements of German formations, but it's often very difficult to decide which ones were um, delayed by Allied air attack and which by resistance activity. I mean, some of the divisions designated for the start for Normandy, the 12th FS Panzer Division and Panzer Lair, reached their concentration areas without difficulty. <clears throat> but um, further south, um, I do go into this in more detail in my book, 
um, SS Das Reich um, had, uh, did face some difficulty, certainly by road, but its rail formations tended to run fairly smoothly, which is not what people tend to remember. In general, the, the Germans, if they felt too threatened, would turn around and smack the resistance very, very hard. Um, and of, of course, the resistance did not have enough weapons. They suddenly had a flood of recruits. Um, very little was done against telecommunications, largely because the man entrusted with contacting the French communications network only arrived in France um, the day before D-Day. But the resistance independently attacked the communications hubs around Le Mans. But a lot of that work against communications was actually done by the Belgian resistance, who found the locations of the main cables, used to dig down and pour acid on them, work out how long it took the Germans to find the break, how long it took them to repair it, and then decided how regularly they would continue attacking the German lines. I mean, when I was writing my book, I felt it was pointless and probably utterly tedious to try and explain every resistance action after D-Day. So I divided the subject into a number of case studies. The first is the advance of SS Das Reich from southwest France to Normandy. The second is the failed French and disastrous French attempt at self-liberation on the Vercor Plateau. And then looked at operations in Brittany. Now this was when the French resistance were working closely with the French SS, uh, SAS and the Americans. Um, and then that, that chapter of work that, that carries on to the start of Operation Dragoon and then the breakout from Normandy and the advance east and towards Paris. I mean, basically, my conclusion is that all the praise that the resistance got from Bradley and Eisenhower that you know, the resistance was worth 10 um, divisions is exaggerated. But nevertheless, the resistance really did make it a nuisance of itself against the Germans. And once the breakout from Normandy happened, um, they could the armies could turn east, secure in the belief that the resistance would hold the Germans on the line of the Loire. But of course, the Germans were by that time realizing they were going to be trapped. So they were fleeing France anyway but hotly pursued by the resistance. So resistance claims to have liberated this town or that town have to be looked at very, very carefully because often it is as the Germans left, they came in. And that is not the resistance liberating the town. Um, but anyway, you would have to look at my book for um, details of what happened then. I think I've run out of time now. So I'll stop now. Thank you very much indeed, Hannock, um, for, for that magisterial contribution. Um, I'm just going to remind everyone that we will be taking questions at the end. Um, so if you do have a question, uh, please pop it in the Q&A uh, sort of chat function, which you can find an icon to um, in the middle of the bottom row, and then we'll be able to address that at the end. Um, but now um, we're going to turn to Nick Hewitt, um, who's going to be talking about um, the maritime contribution. Um, Nick's a naval historian uh, and he's team leader of culture with Orkney Islands Council. He studied history at Lancaster University and war studies at King's College, University of London, before working initially at um, the Imperial War Museums and later at the National Museum of the Royal Navy down in Portsmouth. Nick's been a regular contributor to television and radio, notably as a presenter on the BBC's coast. He's also been a specialist historian for Channel 5's D-Day Sunken Secrets, um, which came out 10 years ago. And he was a presenter for the BBC's Battle of Jutland, the Navy's bloodiest day in 2016. His first book, Coastal Convoys, 1939 to 1945, The Indestructible Highway, was published by Pen and Sword in 2008. 
and he's since published The Kaiser's Pirates in 2013 and Firing on Fortress Europe in 2015. And his latest book, Normandy, The Sailor's Story, Naval History of D-Day and the Battle of Normandy, uh, was published uh, just out with Yale University Press. Uh, uh, and it's a great book, um, so get it if you haven't already. Um, we're going to pass over to, to Nick now. Thank you very much. I'm just going to make sure I can share. Let's see if this happens. Hopefully everybody's starting to see that. Hello. Um, so thank you for that glowing introduction. Um, the naval side of D-Day has been a golden thread running through my career ever since I worked on HMS Belfast um, as a baby historian back in the early 2000s. But every time I approached this story, it got bigger. Belfast had a very specific role. She was a big gun cruiser, and she spent her time on the Normandy gun line, supporting the army by bombarding shore targets. Thousands of other sailors made Neptune happen. They crewed landing ships, tiny assault landing craft, wallowing assault barges. They swept mines, they spotted for the big guns, they protected the flanks of the invasion from attack, they sank block ships under fire, they helped to build the Mulberry Harbours, and later they repaired devastated French ports. Ashore, they planned, organised and delivered the entire operation from drafty offices and underground bunkers. And yet the more I read, the more I realised that these sailors were largely absent from the literature, particularly from more recent publications. Even though Neptune Overlord is widely recognized as the greatest, most complex amphibious operation in history, and amphibious operations depend on ships and sailors. But most readers will usually find one or two, usually operating landing craft, and usually only on the 6th of June, 1944. They appear to be passive facilitators. So the premise of my book is a very simple one, that in the summer of 1944, sailors fought a long, exhausting and dangerous battle at sea, which mirrored the Battle of Normandy on land, one which I have called the Battle of the Seine Bay. Defeat in the Seine Bay may have been unlikely, but even a significant setback could have stalled the land battle and prolonged the war for months. Much early Normandy writing played down any sense of risk associated with the naval campaign, and so it brought to pass Ramsay's worst fear, um, which I've put on this quote on the slide, that it would all be seen as easy and plain sailing. The huge complex Battle of the Seine Bay therefore got compressed into one day of tension and a long exercise in logistics, with sailors as taxi drivers and freight haulers, and most writers metaphorically rushing ashore with the soldiers as soon as they could. Nothing could be further from the truth. Almost every day, before, during and after D-Day, Allied sailors put their lives on the line and ships were lost or damaged, protecting those long, fragile supply lines. And my book is an attempt to rebalance this by writing a naval history of the campaign. I really only look at events on land occasionally, just for context and orientation. My source material is mainly a mix of official documents from the UK National Archives, and various museum collections, supported by memoirs and personal testimony from the Imperial War Museum Sound Archive and the BBC People's War Archive, and various secondary works. We don't know how to advance the slide, that's interesting. Might have to live without the slides. <laughs> oh, no, there we go. So the first third of the book looks at events which preceded D-Day. Um, I've started the story with the Quebec conference between 17th and 24th of August, 1943. When you're dealing with a campaign that hasn't really been looked at before, you, you kind of, there are various points where I could have started, but that was when the final decision was made to carry out the assault landing in Normandy in May, 1944 at that point, and a simultaneous landing in Southern France. I then go on to look at the operations in the Channel from sort of the middle of 1943 until June 1944, which made the waters in and around the Seine Bay a safe operating environment. Of course, not every one of these operations was conceived as an enabling action for Neptune. Most of the sailors taking part have no idea that there was any connection. But indirectly, almost everything helped. And I think it's important to sketch out what was going on. Then look at planning. Ramsey was appointed Allied Naval Commander Expeditionary Force on 25th of October 1943, before Eisenhower and Montgomery, which is a bit of an indicator of just how complex a challenge the naval ops were. Um, Eisenhower and Montgomery then threw him an enormous challenge by expanding the assault to five divisions from three, leading to a huge expansion of the fleet, 
that's quite an easy decision for soldiers to throw another div division at the problem. It's a lot harder for sailors to find the assault shipping. Um, the problem was solved in three ways by requesting US help. Previously, the British had said they would do Neptune on their own. Um, by deferring the landings to June to get another month's worth of landing craft production in Britain, the US, and deferring the southern France landing to allow assault shipping to be transferred from the Mediterranean. Eventually, the fleet that went to the same bay would number more than 7,000 ships and craft, depending on what you count, including 1,213 warships, 79% of them were still British or Canadian. There was still never enough landing craft. The minutely detailed Neptune joint plan was issued on the 28th of February, a staggering 1,000 pages of orders for every commanding officer. The principal tasks were deceptively simple. One, break the crust of the German defences and land the assault formations. And two, continue without delay the supply and reinforcement of the army. The execution, of course, wouldn't be quite so simple. All of this had been informed by an extraordinarily detailed intelligence picture, and sailors played their part there too. But a lot of it came from ultra decrypts, human intelligence, including, as we've just heard, the French resistance, aerial reconnaissance, and covert beach surveys by a remarkable organisation called the Combined Operations Pilotage Parties, or COPS, who crept onto beaches along the entire European coast. Clearly, you couldn't just go to Normandy because you'd give away the location of the invasion. Um, to measure beach gradients and study the consistency of sand and shingle. All these ships needed sailors to man them. In 43-44, Neptune hoovered up most of the British naval recruits who were posted to combined operations to train as landing craft crews. Combined ops training was incredibly hard. It was more like commando training, with sailors spending more time running over hills in battle dress than they did afloat. If they passed, they learned how to operate landing craft, joined their units and practiced as formations, and then took part in huge pre-assault rehearsals. Perhaps the best known is Exercise Tiger, the final rehearsal for Force U, which was attacked by German E-boats, the Allied nickname for the Kriegsmarine Schnellbooten, fast motor torpedo boats, on the night of the 27th, 28th of April. Three precious tank landing ships were lost and 749 US servicemen killed, providing a clear illustration that the Germans remained a danger. The middle third of the book looks at the embarkation of the assault forces, the crossing, the assault landings and the first follow-up waves. Neptune actually officially began at 23.30 on the 25th of May, when naval commanders opened Ramsey's orders and military camps on the south coast of England were sealed. After an unseasonal summer gale caused a 24-hour delay, the Armada finally set off for the five assault areas on the night of the 5th, 6th of June. Sweeping and marking this huge stretch of sea was fraught with danger, and I talk quite a lot about mine sweeping. Neptune was history's biggest mine sweeping operation, involving at least 250 sweepers, some sources say more, and it went on until the end of the campaign. A complex bombardment plan allocated targets to each ship, with heavy ships concentrating on German large caliber coastal batteries capable of reaching the fleet, and smaller ships focusing on pillboxes and other shore defences. Final drenching fire was provided by smaller warships and armed landing craft moving close inshore to suppress the defenders as the landing craft approached. Sailors spotted for the big guns, both ashore, operating with the army, and above in modified Spitfire and Seafire fighters. None of the beaches were easy for sailors, although so often their contribution is minimised. To what give just one example at Omaha, much credit is rightly given to the military junior leaders who rallied their men and led them inland and finally broke the deadlock on the beach. Far less is given to the commanding officers of the destroyers, who on their own initiative took their ships dangerously close inshore to give the army the gunfire support they needed. General Omar Bradley recognised this writing after the war that the Navy saved our hides. As well as dozens of landing craft, two destroyers were lost, the Norwegian Svenner to an attack by German torpedo boats in the east, and USS Corrie to shore battery fire in the west. Next to shore were the follow-up waves, Force L in the British Eastern Task Force area and Force B in the US area, all was all loaded, all that arrived, but was still a very dangerous environment. The Neptune plan aimed to and land on average one and one third army divisions per day after the initial assault. This required an average of eight merchant convoys a day and a 24 hour cycle of landing craft convoys. I only devote a single chapter to this important subject because a narrative of every convoy would get quite repetitive but it's a very important one. I do make the point repeatedly that the daily passages made by landing craft crews and merchant mariners working around the clock to bring the army what it needed 
continued until the end of the Battle of the Same Bay and well beyond. Once the convoys had arrived off the assault areas, the challenge was to get the reinforcements and the supplies they carried ashore. Landing craft and landing ships could simply beach, of course, but for bigger merchant ships, the only option at first was to discharge into ferry craft. Assault landing craft, converted Thames barges, and rhino ferries like the one shown here, bottom left, which was basically a self-propelled raft. To protect the shipping from the weather, Gooseberry breakwaters were made by scuttling old ships off the assault areas, again by sailors, and later two Mulberry artificial harbours, each the size of Dover, were built to allow bigger ships to discharge straight to shore at Saint Laurent in the US sector and Aramanche for the British. All of this needed organising. Royal Navy beach commandos, you can see one bottom right, part of tri-service beach groups, had the job of getting every new arrival off the beach as quickly and efficiently as possible. Similar teams operated in the US sector. Neptune Logistics formed an extraordinary set of acronyms, including BUCO, Build Up Control, which matched shipping to military priorities, TURCO, or Turnaround Control, which moved shipping to ports, and CoREP, the Control Repair Organization, which organized broken hulls to be patched up as quickly as possible. Two overworked naval officers, the Captain Northbound Sailings and Captain Southbound Sailings, acted as traffic cops, directing shipping to their destination and sending empty hulls home. Between the 18th and 21st of June, the worst summer storm in living memory provided a graphic illustration of just how easily things could have gone wrong if it wasn't for Ramsey's excellent planning and execution. Winds reached 4.7, and waves topped around two and a half metres. The storm smashed the US Mulberry, wrecked 800 ferry craft, and virtually stopped any discharge of supplies, men or vehicles, for 36 hours. Thanks to another largely unrecognised group of sailors, the salvage teams, 600 of them had been refloated by the 8th of July. The final third of the book is devoted to a really key point, that the sea battle did not end on D-Day. That vital flow of supplies was under constant attack. The range of threats was considerable, from Luftwaffe night intruder bombers carrying out mine laying and torpedo or bomb attacks, to Kriegsmarine destroyers, e-boats and other small craft operating from Cherbourg and Le Havre. Fire from German heavy coastal guns at Le Havre eventually caused S.W.O.R.D. to be shut down. Further out, U-boats never stopped trying to break through to the convoys. Mines were the most serious challenge faced by the fleet, with the Germans concentrating on the U.S. assault area initially, and then moving the main weight of their mine laying over to the British in the east after D plus one. 25 ships were sunk or damaged by mines in the British area by 25th of June, and 10 warships and 24 other craft were lost in the US sector by the 21st. Rigorous sweeping took care of the more conventional mines, 261 being swept in the US sector and 291 in the British by 3rd of July, but by far the greatest threat was posed by a new type nicknamed Oysters, which responded to the change in water pressure caused by a passing ship and were virtually unsweepable. To deal with all this, a complex interlocking defence line was established to protect the bay from anti-submarine groups and aggressive cruiser and destroyer sweeps out to seaward to patrols and anchored lines of minesweepers, coastal forces craft and armed landing craft on the flanks of the assault area. These defences were famously nicknamed the Trout Line in the British sector. On the 25th of June, an Anglo-American task force supported the US Army in its assault on Cherbourg. This time the Germans were alerted and opposition was tough. All but one of seven heavy ships involved were hit, along with three destroyers. On the 3rd of July, Neptune ended. This was just an administrative, administrative change. It meant nothing to the sailors afloat. From July, a new threat appeared. The Kriegsmarines climbed Camp Verbanda, or small battle units, a lethal mix of human torpedoes, explosive motorboats, and later midget submarines operating from valais sur mer near Le Havre in the British sector. When the US Army broke out, broke out of the beachhead in Operation Cobra on the 25th of July, the naval war changed, but it did not end. In the West, the Allied navies ranged along the French coast, attacking evacuation convoys and driving the last remnants of the Kriegsmarine back into port. The fleet in the bay diminished, with most US ships leaving for home or the Mediterranean to support the southern France landing, but the eastern flank remained dangerous, as the Germans held out in Le Havre until the 12th of September, which is the date I've chosen to end the Battle of the Seine Bay. 917 ships and smaller craft were lost or damaged during Operation Neptune alone to uh, weather and enemy action, including 26 warships of varying sizes lost to all causes and another 84 damaged. I've estimated just under 3,000 sailors lost carrying out operations in or near the Seine Bay 
using the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and other US and British sources. Undoubtedly, considering the sheer number of ships and vessels which took part, these losses were relatively low and certainly acceptable by the grim logic which applies in wartime. This is not the point. The point is that, is that it was not easy if you were involved, either in a position of authority trying to control events or at the sharp end on a ship in the same bay. Every time a ship set off a mine or was torpedoed, most sailors would have wondered if they were next. It surely felt like a battle to them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Nick, for that stirring presentation. Um, we're next going to move on to, um, to Arthur. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce him quickly and then um, we'll have his presentation. Um, but just another reminder, um, we've got some questions coming in, but the more the merrier would be absolutely brilliant. Um, so, so Doctor and also Captain Arthur W. Gullickson, um, CD, PhD, and in the last few weeks elected uh, to a fellowship of the Royal Historical Society, graduated from the University of New Brunswick with a master's degree in history in 2005. He then joined the Canadian Armed Forces in late 2006, where he was posted um, to CFB Gage Towns, the second battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment in late 2008. In 2013, Captain Gullickson was then selected for the postgraduate training list and gained acceptance into the PhD programme in history at Western University in London, Ontario. Um, he graduated in 2016 and was then posted as military faculty to the Royal Military College of Canada. He's a Second World War specialist and his areas of expertise include the study of the replacement of equipment and personnel losses, as well as German armed forces during the late war period. And he, more broadly, he's also interested in 20th century air power and sea power. And he's written a number of books on Normandy, including Bloody Very Air, Volumes 1 in 2022 and Volume 2 in 2023. And it's lessons from, from those books which he proposes to share with us now. Um, Arthur, many thanks. Over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Alex, for having me on. I'll try to share my screen here. I'm sh screen sharing. All right. And um, I'll just turn myself around here. All right. Um, so, yes, uh, my, my book presentation today is on uh, the two bloody verriers volumes one and two um and today's talk i'll summarize the main ideas presented in the two books on the main german defensive effort which i see as south of Caen between 18th of july and 5th of august 1944. so it, it, these two um hills are the focus of my my book the ridges actually uh one is the borgibus ridge which is on the east side of the can Confles highway and as you can see there uh it's uh excellent if you're a tank commander or an artillery observer looking down upon um you know you can see for miles to to the southern suburbs of Caen. And of course, on the west side of the, the Conflays Highway, there's the Verriers Ridge, which is sort of a kidney-shaped um, um, geographical feature, uh, which uh, looks down there. You see on the photo of the uh, the city of or, or town of Mesa Orm. Uh, and across the way, across the Orne River, you see the the in the photo uh, Hill 112 or Hill 113, and the high points west of the Orne, which is also a scene of fierce battles. Uh, so main points I'll discover, discuss, uh, dis, discuss today, the subject matter, uh, my motivation to conduct the research, historical questions addressed, my research methods, uh, the thesis statement for volumes one and two of the Bloody Verriers series, and quickly summarize uh, in the time allowed the, the battles between 18th of July and 5th of August 1944, and then present a few conclusions. Uh, so why two books about a set of ridges, the 1st SS Panzer Corps, Operations Goodwood, Atlantic, and Spring? Why, why something like that? Um, I became fascinated with the amount of resources and effort the Germans put into defending a series of geographical points, hills and ridges, uh, south and west of the city of Caen in July 1944 during the Normandy campaign, these being hills 112 and 113 to the west of the Orne, 
and the Borgibus and Verrier's ridges east of the Orne, south of Caen. And the second area, that's what uh, is the focus or the scene for my two books. I wanted to gain a better understanding of why Anglo-Canadian forces in late July and early August had such a difficult time attacking the ones to the east. Using massive resources in the way of armor, infantry, artillery, even strategic four-engine bombers, uh, major Allied operations such as Goodwood, Atlantic, Spring, in the period 18 July and 5th of August, all failed to break out or were only partially successful in achieving their goals. Parts of these operations, especially some of the minor unit actions in August 1944, were disasters and terrible defeats for the Allies and the Anglo-Canadian forces. So, this, this perfect tank country, we have these two very large topographical features, each one means a great amount to the opposing militaries, both the Germans and the, uh, the Anglo-Canadian forces of the British Second Army. Um, of course, it's the gateway to Flays, the, the wonderful Con Flays Highway, acts as a perfect guide to break out of the Normandy uh, beachhead in dynamic fashion, well-situated for artillery observation, high features, yet perfect for tanks and driving around. Uh, and the Germans saw this as a, a vital ground, perfect for the what they thought the British were about to fight, a second Al Alamein. And this was the gateway to the south. And the Germans felt if it was going to happen, the decisive battle would happen here. So is there, you know, going into this for me, was there a history, historiographical gap? The British military historian Michael Reynolds, the late Major General Michael Reynolds, did work on the Germans in the, the 18th of July, 5th of August period but I felt there was still a hole. No definitive detailed account of Goodwood and Spring existed from the German perspective. Um, the approaches of the French military historians are, are very unique in, in that they, they don't focus exclusively on a nation or a military or an army, but the event itself. I thought the impact of Goodwood on the German military was misunderstood and much more important in focusing their efforts south of Caen. I also wanted to re-examine the role and capabilities of the British and Canadian armies. So, historical questions that I addressed. What were the German organizations fighting the British Second Army? How were they organized and led? How did they conduct their defense? How did they fight? What did the Germans view the ridges west and, and south of Caen? How did they view them? What was their importance? And a deep analysis into these questions was largely, I felt, a blank slate. Other accounts, such as the uh, late Major General Reynolds' uh, wonderful series of books on, on the Germans in Normandy, summarized events, but lacked detail that I wanted to go into. And also, there's this. This is a very important factor, the myth of Goodwood. How did the British Army and the Camberley Staff College Battlefield Tours see Operation Goodwood in the 1960s? Well, a battle was needed. A battle was needed that could be applicable to the situation the British Army of the Rhine found itself in uh, facing these huge hordes of T-62s and later T-72 tanks of the Red Army poised to attack West Germany. And they needed a, a, a battle that would epitomize the, the, a smaller inferior force fighting off a larger juggernaut, which is how they saw the Germans and the British in, in Normandy in the Second World War. But we, we also needed to incorporate the Bundeswehr, our new West German allies, and their veterans from a veteran perspective. And of course, the only political acceptable ones were from the 21st Panzer Division, which the British 8th Corps uh, very decisively defeated. And some of these 21st Panzer Division and Schwer Panzer Abtelung 503 Tiger Tank Commanders become celebrities and almost media talking heads But you know, the question, you know, you look at the maps and the battle maps and the events, there was another force that was fighting and holding back the entire British Second Army and inflicting some terrible defeats on it at, from time to time, at the same time being defeated. Um, it was this, the Waffen SS. Now, are these two books that I've written in the Bloody Barrier series about war criminals? Yes. Nearly all surviving high-ranking Waffen SS up. SS officers involved were later prosecuted for war crimes, but in the height of 
the military expansion of 1944 within Germany, these were the military elite of the Third Reich. They were committed Nazis that did execute prisoners and civilians. Some escaped to South America, such as the fellow on the far right, Stubbenfjell Herbert Kuhlmann, who is the Panther tank commander, who aided Joseph Mengele to escape into the, the jungles of South America. But, you know, even, um, you know, the SS Panzer Regiment 1 commander, you see him there, Oben Stubbenfjell, um, Josen Piper, and the half-track battalion commander in the Liebstandata, the 1st SS Panzer Division, Josef Diethensal, very much war criminals, but they are part of the historical narrative, and they are fighting the main battle, holding back the entire British Second Army south and west of Caen. But they were largely cut out of the picture in the 1960s, because, of course, they're Nazis. They can't be running around on battlefield tours or, you know, be part of the British Army narrative on, you know, how exactly they're pulled back the, the Red Army. And there's this. I was very much... Uh, fascinated by the first SS Panzer Corps, you know what? What and what was its headquarters? How did it operate? What was its key officers? Who were they? I wanted to know about all the components, how it controlled its divisions. Is something not investigated historically today? A gap, for example, exists. Uh, there's no books on. Well, maybe there are books. You know, I don't want to embarrass myself on how the headquarters of the British Eighth Corps, the British First Corps, the Canadian Second Corps functioned and fought their battles and how their leaders, you know, how smart were they? Were their chiefs of staff, such as Brigade and Führer, uh, Fritz Kramer, you know, really pulling the strings for Obergruppen Führer Sepp Dietrich, see him walking there with Rommel, you know, was, was Dietrich a stupid man? Was he mildly intelligent? You know, I, I didn't know any of these things. Um, so my research methods, uh, you know, you look at the books like uh, Martin Middlebook, rights you know they focus on one day some of the the air battles and i wanted to go into that ultra detail uh, with with a day or two to three days uh, consisting of a chapter and i translated primary and secondary sources from french authors and used uh, a lot of surviving uh, what what i could that was surviving from the bundes archive and i wanted to focus on historical events though from the German perspective, but not exclusively on one nation and incorporating all the combatants. So my main argument, what exactly am I, am I arguing here with these books? South of the Norman city of Caen, the twin features of Verriers and Borgia Bush Ridges were key stepping stones for the British Second Army in late July, 1944. Taking them was crucial if it was to be successful in its attempt to break out of the Normandy bridgehead. To capture this vital ground, Allied forces would have to defeat arguably the strongest German armored formation in Normandy, the 1st SS Panzer Corps Liebstandata. Uh, the resulting battles in late July and early August and some of the minor actions saw powerful German defensive counterattacks south of Caen inflict tremendous casualties, regain lost ground, and at times defeat Anglo-Canadian operations in detail. Viewed by the German leadership as military critical, the majority of its armored assets were deployed to dominate this excellent tank country. Uh, east of the Orne River. These defeats and the experience of meeting an enemy with near equal resources explored a flawed Anglo-Canadian offensive tactical doctrine that was overly dependent, I feel, on the supremacy of the Royal Artillery and Royal Canadian Artillery. Furthermore, weaknesses in Allied tank technology inhibited their armored forces from fighting a decisive armored battle, you know, somewhat similar to Desert Storm in 1991. And this, was, and this in turn forced Anglo-Canadian infantry and artillery forces to later rely on First World War infantry bite and hold tactics, infantry first, massively supported by artillery. So what were the challenges affecting the Germans? The, well, every time they lost a tank or a truck, there wasn't a replacement one for a unit. Railroad system is largely unusable in Northwest France. There's no new infantry replacements, no air superiority, and daytime Luftwaffe ground attack missions have terrible trouble. There's no ability to conduct fluid mobile warfare and move, its, move units around due to the Yabo uh, um, tank hunting um, fighter bombers and no regular supply of fuel and munitions. So we see these collision of doctrines, the Allied artillery-centered operations versus the German panzer group-based operations, the Allies wielding these dominant artillery forces that become unified at very short notice to bombard a certain area. And the Germans, they're very good at handling tank attacks, but are attrited slowly but surely by this artillery-based doctrine of the British Army. 
So the Goodwood battle plan, Goodwood rolls around. By 18th of July, three British armored divisions are stacked up. Three corps are ready to attack. A vast number of resources are deployed. And was this a strategic breakout attack? I believe there's no doubt about it. It certainly was. Uh, the United States Air Force and the RAF uh, target squares, which they bombard with their strategic heavy bombers. And the 8th Corps, the Centerpiece Corps, uh, under General uh, Lieutenant General Richard O'Connor, was to fight its way down into onto the Keys Blaine Conflays Highway and break out of the Normandy Bridgehead using these massive resources and these three corps. Um, and initially, the British and Canadians push forward uh, after the massive airstrike that occurs, and the British and Canadians are winning. And initially, it's a huge success. So, uh, Southern Con is liberated, and the British 29th Armored Brigade approaches the vital Wurgebus Ridges, which the Germans see are very important. And as the 21st Panzer Division is defeated, and the, the, the uh, 16th Luftwaffe Feld Division is overrun, the 272nd Infantry Division driven back, the Germans are forced to deploy their reserve, the 1st SS Panzer Division leaps and data to save these, these vital ridges. And the Germans don't just have one good go at the British 29th Armored Brigade, but they attack them twice. Once with the Panther Tank Abtelung, the Panther Abtelung on the left hand side, and then secondly with the Assault Gun Battalion, uh, as well as at the same time on top of Varier's Ridge, what's left of the flak artillery, anti-tank guns, as well as the 21st Panzer Division forces are all blasting away at the British for all they're worth. And um, because of the, the limited frontage, the British armored brigades can't all deploy at once. It's like a revolving door from the, into the Harrods department store in downtown London. One customer can come in, but they need time. And so the Germans can actually gain a numerical tank superiority in this very limited, limited area of ground and savage the British 29th Armored Brigade. And once uh, Goodwood is shut down, uh, the Canadians feel their uh, dual enterprise Atlantic still has some chance to seize the Western Hill, Barriers Ridge, and the Germans, now that the British have stopped, turn on the Canadians with their Panzer Regiment, as well as a battle group from the 2nd Panzer Division and the 272nd Infantry Division, and they force the Canadians back in some places off Barriers Ridge. And this brings us to the second book, which is Operation Spring in the later battles of Tilly La Campagne. So now, as, as the, 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 the British forces somewhat re regroup, and prepare for future operations, the Canadians are given a chance to attack. There you see Lieutenant General Simmons of the 2nd Canadian Corps, Jester Inch at Churchill, Montgomery, and Dempsey in their staff car. Uh, he's pointing to Verrier's Ridge of where he's going to attack. And they attack at night, on the night of the 24th, 25th of July. And it's, it's, it's a terrible defeat in places for the Canadian infantry battalions who attack just as they attacked in Italy Infantry first, supported by tanks, and there seems to be a lack of recognition that the Germans operate their panzers 24 hours a day and were very much ready to fight a second Goodwood, ready to fight a massive tank battle, which they deploy their assets to right away, uh, savaging the infantry forces. And the Germans also use, very interestingly, these mine shafts that go from the River Orne all the way across to Verrier's Ridge, as well as from St. Martin and Maceron, in which the Germans hide from the Canadian artillery and the Royal Artillery uh, Field Artillery Units. A terrible defeat occurs for the Black Watch, and this is a, an event burned into Canadian historiography. Um, Major Stars, you see him there on the right of Camp Group Stars, uh, uh, annihilates the Black Watch with other 2nd Panzer Division forces, and the Germans. Um, they also try to defeat uh, the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, and this is the one shining light of success on Barriers Ridge. They managed to hold this, but can only hold Barriers Village, the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry, with uh, massive inter intervention from the British 7th Armored Division, which fights back the German tanks. And during this whole time for spring, this spring was another massive breakout operation. The British 7th Armored Division and the Guards Armored Division were stacked up waiting for the, the, the infantry divisions to destroy the German uh, front line of resistance, allowing them to break out. 
which never happens. The, the operation is largely shut down. Uh, but there's some very bitter fighting that goes on right into August, especially in this place, Tilly La Campagne. You see there in the photo, it's obliterated right off the face of the earth, but the German resistance is ferocious. And of course, they use their best panzer divisions. They unleash the uh, the 9th SS Panzer Division, Hohenstaufen, the same day on the 25th and in the following days because they think this is it. This is another Goodwood and we have to get going. There's no time to waste. And they unleash their best panzer divisions, the 1st SS Panzer Division, the 9th SS Panzer Division, this uh, large battle group from the 2nd Panzer Division, as well as the infantry forces of the 272nd Infantry Division, all fighting uh, the British 2nd uh, Army, as well as the Canadian 2nd Corps and British 8th Corps. Um, and they, they fight back uh, the British 7th Armored Division, pushing them slowly but surely off uh, the uh, Farrier's Ridge and continuing to attack to destroy the Canadian 2nd Infantry Division, which whose line barely, barely holds mass, uh, due to the intervention of the British 7th Armored Division, 131st British Infantry Brigade, as well as the 22nd uh, British Armored Brigade of uh, North African fame. So what's happening to the West? Of course, Cobra strikes. And poor Paul Hosser, there well, he's not poor, um, sitting beside Rommel before Rommel gets wounded. Uh, he doesn't have the strategic armored reserve that they do south of Khan. And of course, when the, the Americans attack with this massive airstrike using the B-17s to blast a huge square, it's virtually annihilating the Panzer Lear Panzer Division, then they then fight a, a determined infantry battle uh, following which their armored columns break out into the bocage, dominating the roadway system, and before the Germans can get in front of them or deploy what reserves they do have, which are fairly weak, the Americans have broken out and the entire front is beginning to crumble. Of course, this would not have been possible without the best German forces deployed almost exclusively in front of the Second Canadian Corps, the British Second Army, and thus pinning them down as well as against the British uh, on Hills 113 and 112 until it was too late. U.S. breakout develops after a bitter U.S. 7th Corps infantry attack with the Germans cannot contain. Uh, some prodding uh, continues on the Canadian front. Um, however, powerful German forces are still there and several uh, Canadian infantry battalions are virtually annihilated, attempting to hold down the British or to um, hold them, but these are minor efforts which the Germans respond with with massive forces or very powerful forces. Um, of course, other powerful forces being held down at the same time by Operation Blue Coat, which is now acting as the real holding operation to stop the German panzer divisions from racing to the west, allowing the Americans to continue their, their breakout. And um, rather than maximum force, and this is something I point out in the books, the Canadian forces, they use minimum force rather than the three to one um, ratio we use within NATO armies today. And as a result, heavy casualties are lost. So conclusion, last, last slide here. The Germans operate under limitations. What they can accomplish, they do. Anglo-Canadian forces are superbly supported with artillery and air support, uh, but the ability of the Anglo-Canadian forces to attack with armor and win decisively an armored battle when forced to fight one is, is not there due to the technology present. The Canadian infantry first operations are badly mauled and the rigid, ridges are seen as key by the Germans, not just west of the Orne, but east of the Orne as well. And all the resources, all the, the very um, well-equipped German panzer divisions that still survive, they're, they're deployed there. Um, the United States First Army breaks out, massively aided in the process by a total lack of German armored reserves to the west, poor and inflexible German command and control, and Hitler's not an inch will be surrendered orders. Germans cannot get there in time to get in front of the Americans. The Americans prove to be relentless in their assault. And the key were German reserves are all near Khan, waiting to fight, waiting to fight another battle of El Alamein that never comes after Goodwood. And that's it. And this is the new book. You see it there. There's uh, my brand new book, The Defeat and Attrition of the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Jugend, Volume 1, the, the Normandy Battles, uh, Bridgehead Battles, 7th to 11th of June. And that's it. Hopefully, uh, Alex, I haven't busted the time here limit, but. No, no, not at all. Thank you very much indeed, Arthur. Um, 
we have half an hour remaining for questions. Um, so a good amount of time, and we've received a, a fair number of questions already. Um, if I might be cheeky and abuse my chair's privilege and ask the first question to all three of you, um, it's really a methodological question inspired by something Dan Snow said about Nick's recent book. He says, Hewitt's achieved the impossible. He's retold the story of D-Day in a way that transforms our understanding. I, I think in various ways, you, you've all done what, what Dan says and achieved the impossible by, by telling us something new and original, which we didn't know already, about a story which has been very heavily retold over the past 80 years. Um, so I think it'd be really valuable for everyone on this um, event if you would share your wisdom about how to go about creating revisionist history. Um, so Arthur, you shared some methodological insights, but perhaps if, if you and the others would build on that, um, how do you write fresh history of stories that have already been quite well told? What all did you want to put people in? Uh, I don't mind. Why don't we go in the order in which you spoke? Um, so, so oh, OK, I mean, what, what I felt when I was approaching the resistance is that when most people hear the word resistance, they immediately assumed armed resistance. And they have this sort of semi-romantic image of agents parachuting in and leading ill-equipped partisans against the might of the German army. Well, I mean, the armed resistance only really got going in 1943. And I was curious to know what happened earlier um, and particularly what happened before SOE was first of all created and then was actually capable of carrying out some decent operations. So my whole approach was to take it chronologically, the subject chronologically in three um, sections, the first up to the German invasion of the Soviet Union, the next up to the surrender of Italy in September 1943. Um, and then we really get on in the last section to the armed resistance. But by looking at it in Europe, I, I was trying to get away from this sort of nationalist idea of this country was the only one to do this, or this country was the first one to do this. And look how basically all the countries face similar challenges although the solutions they found were, were often different um, and certainly largely because of the German behaviour, the results were very different. Thank you very much. Um, let's pass over to Nick, please. Yeah, mine was, a, <clears throat> mine was a very different story to Alex, actually. Mine was, mine was a slow burn. Um, I talked about that golden thread and actually it really was the case that for 15 years in various different jobs in, in museums, I was involved in different elements of the looking after the naval heritage of the Normandy campaign. So from HMS Belfast, I then I then went into a job where I had had custody of a motor gunboat for a while that was in Normandy. And then I restored a tank landing craft and, and all these things. The more I dug into Normandy, the more I found these these kind of isolated bits of the naval contribution that were missed out. And the more it grew into this vast story for me. And then, then I had this kind of epiphany moment, really, where I thought there is a naval battle here. And, and actually, in, in the book, I, I stick my my neck out, really, and say, in my opinion, it's probably the most significant in the West, in the in the German war, um, other than the Battle of the Atlantic, you know, and the, the Battle of the Atlantic enables it. Because our concept of battle changes in the 20th century, uh, certainly at sea, naval battles are not fought in a day, you know, where the, the whole of the opposition fleet is sunk. They're, they're things that last for months or years. Um, and actually, if you look at it like that, I think I think there is a very complex, comprehensive campaign that you can pull out. And, and I really do make very limited references to the, the land campaign because there is a constant activity at sea that's going on. So it was born out of frustration, really, that um, a, a lot of my work over the years has been around airbrushed sailors from for one reason or another. And, and this, I think, was probably the, the biggest story of all about airbrush sailors. I'm, I'm the only person who watches Saving Private Ryan and doesn't rant about the absence of Brits, but I rant about the absence of those American destroyer commanders who were really went the extra mile. Yeah, it would have been fantastic to see them written back into the narrative for Saving Private Ryan because um, they were taking some extraordinary risks to support the troops on shore. Um, they were, yeah. Um, yeah, 
Um, it's something I always try and point out to, to my army officers whenever we're on staff rides on Omaha Beach. Um, let's go to Arthur, please. Um, oh, uh, yes, I, whenever I went to France in the past, I, you know, going to all the gift shops, uh, I'd often see the, these books over the battlefield, Operation Goodwood, over the battlefield, and and uh, Operation Blue Coat and uh, Ian Dalgish wrote those books and they were spectacular. I thought because it was new and inventive, and I wanted to do something like that. And I and unfortunately, um, Ian Dalgish he he passed away in a in a plane accident, uh, a plane crash. But um, I, I was fascinated with with his books and his approach. But they seem to lack uh, sort of the detail of the Germans, so that the sort of that that German uh, perspective or detail of their operations uh, that that is present in German accounts and French accounts, it was never uh, present for Anglophone off uh, uh, readers. So um, you know, I'm very much inspired by Martin Middlebrook, who who recently passed away, but I, and I'll never have the chance to meet him either. I, I was very much taken by the the one day approach to to um, telling a story or you know making a day a chapter, um, and I felt the the Germans, despite these these despicable war criminals, you know the the languishing in prison for a dozen years after World War II, um, or you know executing Canadian prisoners of war, that they are part of the historical narrative in Normandy, and and thus uh, the detail needs to be provided. Uh, to to how they fought the British Army, how they fought the Canadian Army. Um, so um, taking those two approaches, I took that uh, to Casemate, the, the publishers there, and Ruth Shepard was very, very uh, kind, uh, very supportive. And um, I also made contact uh, with uh, the, the Czech military archives. Now, this was decisive for me in that the, there's this, it sounds like something out of a movie. There was a castle, and that's where the Waffen SS had their, all their archives. And of course, they destroyed a tremendous amount of it at the end of the Second World War. But some stuff did survive, and the Czechs, you know, good on them. They ran up to the the castle, grabbed everything they could, took it back to what would become the Czech military archives in Prague in the Czech Republic. And if you go through a very very determined um, requisition process for reproductions, you can get a lot of the things. Um, that uh, survived that are German or Waffen SS and to to suddenly put uh, a face or a detail to those actions uh, you know who exactly is attacking the British 29th Armored Brigade how do they do it you know what do they do how do they personally control the operations and suddenly all the the detail that was missing uh, from Michael Reynolds and Ian Daglish's books you know, the, even though they're spectacular books, all it all of a sudden it appeared, and of course Ruth Shepard snapped it up, and the the rest is history. Brilliant! Thank you very much indeed, all three of you. Um, we've received questions from the audience, actually targeting all three of you. Um, so perhaps if we go back to Halleck, um, Grant Harwood asks. Were those Allied commanders' assessments of the value of the French resistance to D-Day what they really believed or motivated by politics or something else? Um, so those assessments of, of 10 divisions or so, um, were they authentic? Were they genuine? Well, I mean, that, that wasn't just about D-Day. I mean, that was about the liberation of France as a whole. Um, the greatest impact was in the South, the support to Operation Dragoon. Um, because the resistance revealed in advance, you can make it to Grenoble in 10 days. And the Allied planners were sort of like, no, 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 we can't. They did. And that was because the resistance had blown up every bridge, um, including some the Allies would have actually preferred to have used, um, which had to be quickly rebuilt. Um, but they had trapped the, the admittedly fleeing Germans, um, and they liberated various of the Mediterranean town, the coastal towns such as Nice and Cannes, virtually by themselves. Um, also, with when the Americans sent a rapid advance force with tanks going up the the road towards Grenoble, the French resistance acted as infantry, which was something they were totally 
untrained for and unprepared for and you know had heavy losses as a result but that's where i th i think the the real impact of the french resistance was in in providing the manpower there in infantry i mean in the north it's more problematic simply because they had been unable to form large bodies um though you know you'd have to look at my books to look at exactly what happened in brittany um but you know by the end they were entrusted <clears throat> sufficiently that okay we're advancing the allies are advancing into germany the germans are still holding the atlantic ports the ffi can make sure that they stay bottled up there <clears throat> Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got quite a few questions which pertain to the naval dimension, but um, two people have asked variants <laughs> on the same theme, which is why has it taken so long for the naval contribution to the Normandy landings to catch up with the army narrative, which has dominated for so long? Like, why have sailors been over? Um, well, I'd, I'd had a quick look at in advance of that question. It's an interesting one. I think there are a number of reasons. Um, I think... Um, I think it was that it was a battle that the Germans couldn't win. So it's much harder to explain what the consequences of failure might have been. The, you know, the consequences of failure in the Seine Bay are not that the Allies would have been thrown back in, into Britain. It, that The Germans didn't have the capacity to do that. But you're talking about a delay and delays to the land campaign. When you get that great storm, actually, when you unpick that, the land fighting stops when the supply flows cease over the beach. So actually, if the Germans had been able to get their act together and interdict for a week, the consequences could have been very serious. Um, I think there's an unwillingness in the post-war narratives to introduce peril and risk, because I think similar to actually what Arthur was saying about that, you know, when are these things being written? They're being written at a time when they don't want to dissuade people from doing large scale assault landings. They don't want to make it look dangerous. Um, I think I, I always come back to Ramsey's quote because it all went so smoothly. It may seem to some people that it was easy in plain sailing. It wasn't. It was excellent planning and execution. But the main reason I really do believe this is um, Ramsey died in 1945 in January in a plane crash. He didn't write a memoir. The, the, so, the, the soldiers tell the story of Normandy, the real hard hitting memoirs from Normandy. You know, Montgomery, never a man to hide his light under a bushel. Eisenhower wants to be president. You know, that there, there are some very, very big prominent soldiers writing those histories of the campaign. And both of them are, are they're, they're not ungenerous to the sailors in their work, actually, even Montgomery. But they certainly don't go into any kind of detail about what was going on at sea because they just simply weren't aware of it. Yeah. Had Ramsey written a really you know good post-war memoir, his diary is very illuminating, but that doesn't come out for some years. So that's what I, mainly the soldiers get to tell the story, I think. Thanks, Nick. And, and sticking with you for a moment, um, there's a couple of uh, fairly technical questions. Um, the first one is, how difficult was it to transfer landing craft from the Mediterranean and back? Um, how long did it take and how dangerous was it? Um, that, that's a question I'm going to have to shamelessly dodge. It, it, it's as long, it depends depends what you're driving. Um, so the little assault you know, landing craft, they, they don't come back under their own steam anyway. Um, LCTs are brought back um, under their own power. That's pretty dangerous. They're not massively seaworthy. Um, there are incidents of LCTs being lost um, just from weather. Um, I had a terrific account in the book of the, the headquarters ship HMS Largs, which is a, a converted liner. Um, that comes back. It gets caught in a terrible storm in the Bay of Biscay. Um, the ship is, is trashed. She loses a funnel. Um, all the landing craft that are hanging from davits get swept away. Um, the the war, fresh water tanks are broached. Um, but for some bizarre reason, the ship is ballasted with um, canned beetroot. I got this from an oral history. And by the time they get back to the UK, they're drinking basically stale beetroot juice because it's all they've got. And when she comes into Portsmouth, into the Solent, um, they're, everybody's out cheering them because they think the ship's been in action because she's so, been so badly knocked about. So, you know, it, it dep there are a variety of different journeys, um, but it's it's not an easy job. And, and actually that decision is, is is quite complex about what are you going to strip out of the Mediterranean and, you know, how, when, how soon can you strip it back out and, and send it back so that they can do the Southern France landings, which is probably a whole different conference in its own right. Thank you. Uh, and there's another question here. Um, what was the organization of naval gunfire observers? Um, how low do they go into the army structure and how far forward 
and what types of target did they engage once the battle moved inland? Oh, great question. Um, they're they're um, very low in the army structure. They're battalion level or even lower. They are um, right up forward. They're, they're as far front as they can get. They're shooting at everything. Um, so basically you have that, that all that pre-arranged fire. And then as soon as the troops are ashore, because you have that worry about friendly fire and blue on blue, the, the responsibility then switches to the, the naval gunfire observers. They are mixed teams of Royal Artillery and Naval personnel. Um, so you often get a Royal Artillery officer because he obviously knows, understands what the army wants, but then the signals personnel tend to be sailors. Um, they drop in with the paratroops. Um, in quite a few oral histories refer to parachute sailors, which is quite amusing that that's what they're doing. Um, they are, there's a real difficulties getting them ashore um they get they, they go in with the assault waves and that's not a great decision if you read the reports generally everybody says don't send them in with the assault waves because it's, it's just not an appropriate environment they can't get themselves set up and they lose their radios and they take casualties but once they are established they're absolutely instrumental and i'm sure arthur will will confirm you know the impact of naval gunnery on on the german defenders um the, the one example i put in is is um actually 12th ss panzer divisions commanding officer is is taken out by naval gunfire miles and miles behind the lines um, at his headquarters so they're absolutely instrumental as are the airborne spotters who are really crucial thank you nick um speaking about arthur let's move in your direction um i'm going to take the questions slightly out of sequence um to, to the order in which they came in because i think there is clear synergy between two of them um how do you respond to historians who don't think that Montgomery expected major breakthroughs around Caen and argue shall not flesh relying on artillery saved British and Canadian lives while at the same time succeeding in attriting the Germans. And oh. what, what do you make of that thesis? Ah, I, I uh, well, I, I believe there definitely was uh, two major breakout attempts, Goodwood and spring were you know the, the the british armored divisions were very much set up to to attack and break out right down the cane fillets highway um the, the the supremacy of the the royal artillery was undisputed its ability to triangulate its command structure its ability to unify its guns for a common purpose uh these were the major killers of the german troops within normandy and the wounding uh you know of the officers etc, uh, etc, cetera, et cetera, as well as uh, completely stopping the, the ability of the Germans occasionally to move and the artillery, they were a 24 hour day operation. Uh, as there's bad weather didn't really mean much to them. They, as long as the, the gunners had time to sleep and there was enough shells to fire, the guns were firing. And so the Royal Artillery, I believe is, is the absolute cream of the British army in Normandy and, 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 in fact, wins the battle of attrition that uh, the, the 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 Allies win, uh, forcing the German front to break and Cobra to to succeed. Um, but um, yes, I, I believe Montgomery viewed things with a, a, a post-war lens in order to his, enhance his reputation. And of course, was this an attempt to write down German armor and pin those Panzer divisions in place? Well, I, I, you know, it look, certainly looks good on the page and helps him, you know, whatever way he's going to spin it, he, he would spin it, of course, because he had to think of his, his post-war, um, uh, how history would view him. And, of course, I believe that did concern him quite a bit. Thanks, Arthur. And in that, you've already answered one of the other questions, which is the status of Operation Spring, um, whether it was a serious attempt to break, break through and break out or simply a holding action as claimed by General Simmons. Um, why do you think Gen General Simmons took that line then? Oh, um, this is very, this is interesting. General Folks was commander and later later uh, chief of the Canadian Defence Staff um, at, before Simmons. He was promoted over him post-war. And when interviewed, Folks, Charles Folks said that Simmons told him very directly, you know, on the front lines, you know, just uh, south of Caen, that this is very much a breakout operation and his division the second Canadian infantry division had a very clear mission to destroy that first german line of defenses using infantry night attacks but you know of course both men went to their deaths claiming you know what what they wanted the the world to believe of them of course um 
Um, Simmons, it, the spring was an unmitigated disaster in some ways, apart from the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry and several Canadian Infantry Battalions uh, were annihilated. And the fact that it was an all volunteer army, there was no conscripts. So, you know, these, these, um, these infantry replacements, there's a finite number. And while it was all well and good in Italy to have, you know, to have enough reinforcements there, uh, once the, the battle and the fighting really got going within Normandy, um, the casualties were simply too much, and this led to the Canadian Infantry Reinforcement Crisis, which takes place in August, which is another entirely different kettle of fish. But um, both men were very dynamic personalities, uh, but Simmons, he has tremendous successes, also some terrible, terrible failures. So Can uh, Canada and Canadians should always view him with that balanced approach through the historical lens. Thanks, Arthur. Um, one more question for you, and then we'll, we'll sort of switch focus. Um, there's a question here about the role of German 88s in knocking out British tanks and stopping Goodwood. I, I suspect that that's referring to the incident with Hans von Luck on the outskirts of Kenny. Yes. Um, how important really were they, do you think, and how were they integrated in the, in the German defences? Um, there were some deployed forward, but a limited number. And I discussed this at length in the first book, that their, their role has been vastly overstated uh, within the, the Norman or Goodwood historiography. It was mainly the, the, the Tiger tanks and the Panther tanks and the, the Sturmgeschultz, as well as the assault guns from the 21st Panzer Division that were doing the majority of the killing, as well as from the anti-tank battalion within the 21st Panzer Division, though it was defeated conclusively by the British 8th Corps um, it was still fighting as hard as it could with its remnants. So yes, there were a few flak guns and that, that story with Hans von Luck, he played that for all it was, was, was worth post war, you know, again and again on a battlefield tour after battlefield tour. And, you know, some historians have even gone forward to say, you know, they're not so sure this, this occurred the way he <laughs> was telling it, but you know, I, that's, that's a road I won't go down on this, on this particular program. Thank you. Thanks, Arthur. And, and like you said, um, the audience he was selling it to wanted to buy that narrative uh, because the British officers desperately wanted to believe that highly motivated individuals could hold back waves of armour sweeping in their direction uh, because that would have meant the li life and death to them um, in Germany in the 1960s. Um, Nick, you've got a hand up. Um, so over to you. Yeah, just just to really jump in on that 88 question. The, the 88 for sailors is like the tiger tank for soldiers. You know how every soldier in Normandy thought he'd been shot at by a tiger tank? Every sailor in Normandy who was shot at from the shore thought he'd been shot at by an 88, and that's how they recorded it. Um, and, and actually, nine times out of ten, they weren't. Uh, other coastal guns are available. Um, it's just interesting how much it's, it's in the mythology, even in the, at the time, it's always 88s. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, Halleck, um, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is, how did the Allied perception of the politics of the various Mackie groups in the field impact operations in June 1944? Uh, and then I'll also add on the back of that a second question from me, which is, you mentioned that Mackie tends to have the most impact in areas like the Ver Corps, which is pretty mountainous, or in uh, sort of forests and remote areas. Um, is, is that down to the topography being more favorable for asymmetric operations, or, or is it also down to sort of differences in politics? Are there regional differences in levels of resistance and collaboration which come to the fore? Well, really, the Mackey had to be built up in the mountains and the forests simply because they had to find somewhere to, to hide. I mean, these people had left home, um, and so they had to go there. And the whole idea of the Mackie in the original con conception was to engage in hit and run tactics and then disappear back into the mountains and the uh, forests. They were not supposed to fight ground battles. And this was the tragedy of Vercor, that they he held this sort of so-called liberated area and somehow convinced themselves, and I go into the controversy about that, that they would be resupplied by French, with French troops from Algiers. So when they heard the gliders coming, the planes coming and towing gliders, they assumed that was the French reinforcements. And instead it was the SS coming to wipe them out. Um, 
and from different groups, the FDP, the communists, were very much more for liberation of towns. And in fact, they precipitated a number of tragedies by just marching into a town too early. I mean, and um, you know, particularly when they encountered um, Das Reich, they lost out very heavily. But that was their, their politics. They wanted to be known as we liberated this town. Um, but, you know, ge in general, there was, you know, utter chaos on that. Um, the Allies, I mean, to answer the question, that um, with the Allies were concerned about the communists, the French, particularly, you know, de Gaulle's French, were very worried about the communists. Um, after the war, the communists claimed, oh, you never gave us enough weapons. There was a conspiracy against us because we were communists. But it, in fact, the, the SOE circuit leaders would hand out weapons to whoever was the most competent. But, you know, even within the communist ranks after the war, they, they had great arguments over who'd done what. You know, they, they, they came up with this idea of 75,000 communist uh, martyrs in the French resistance. Well, there weren't 75 people in the French resistance <laughs> um, before D-Day anyway. Um, so, you know, the politics continues to rank on. And this is why you have to go to the local studies for historians who, who've looked at very you know, narrow areas to find out exactly who was there. But even those who you know, said they were communists were not necessarily actually communist. Thank you. And with four minutes remaining, I think there's time for one final question. Uh, apologies if we haven't got round um, to having your question. Um, and, and this one comes from one of the regional directors of our North American subgroup. And she asks, um, she wanted she thanks you for these great presentations and wants to take the opportunity to ask each of you on the eve of the 80th anniversary of D-Day, um, how we'll be reconsidering the conflict towards the 100th anniversary and, and how this new research, which you've all undertaken individually, uh, will feature into building a new narrative. Uh, what will we be writing and teaching about D-Day and its follow-on campaigns in 2024 um, that we are not now? Um, so, so I think it's a brilliant question to finish on. Um, where next? Well, I think my my idea would probably be an approach similar to my book on resistance, the pan-European approach, because it wasn't just D-Day. Rome was liberated just before D-Day. Two weeks later, you've got Operation Begaration in the East. And I think that you have to look more at the situation in the whole of Europe rather than folk just looking at one area and look at the impact. Because, you know, in many ways, D-Day was necessary, not just as a military operation, but more essential as a political operation to put the allies on the continent so they could stand up to Stalin and basically stop Stalin going to Paris, as Alexander had managed against Napoleon. Thank you. Um, should we go to Nick, please? Yeah, um, so I've got three quick points on that. Firstly, um, I hope that we'll be stripping out the hindsight. Um, D-Day could have failed. Uh, amphibious operations are complex and dangerous, and it could have failed. And it's only hindsight that really makes us think it was all very easy. Um, I think, um, following up on Halleck's point, uh, alliance, this is an alliance warfare, um, certainly in that kind of great big picture stuff. But also, if you are focused on Normandy, Normandy is an alliance campaign. So will we finally please stop, you know, arguing about was it the Americans or was it the British or, you know, who 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 did it? They all did it. That's the point of alliance warfare. So I think that's that's an interesting one. And the other thing for me, I think, is let's just never forget it's a combined operation. And and I, the more work we see that pulls those kind of tri-service stories together, um, you know, just in the course of my research, I've focused on sailors, but you've got sailors ashore, you've got airmen afloat, you've got soldiers afloat. You've got Americans in the British sector. You've got Brits in the American sector. You've got Canadians everywhere. You know, it's it's an alliance warfare. It's a combined operation. It's very complex and nuanced. Thank you. And Arthur, 
Oh, I would like to see um, more of the approach of the French military historians. There's there's sort of a hub of military history out of the University of Caen in, in Normandy. And, and there's some many, many brilliant authors and historians there who, who look at the event rather than being focused on a certain military or a certain nationality. And of course, they, they have the ability to, to walk around the battlefields constantly. And um, I, I believe their work is very, very underrated. Also, um, German military historians, I believe, such as Karl Heinz Freiser, uh, he, he, his work and others like him, I believe the, the surface has yet to be scratched. And there, there's a huge disconnect between the German historical community and their military history, uh, which I think may change in the future. Uh, this is something that German historians, due to various political reasons that are all very, very good, have, have moved away from. But um, as more time passes, Germany as a nation may, may charge back into its military history and produce some amazing works, as well as uh, the uh, many French works that, that I believe people, especially Anglophones, uh, should pick up. Thanks, Arthur. Let's go back to Nick, please. Yeah, very, very briefly. Sorry, you just made me think of something, Arthur. I think the other thing that's a really exciting opportunity is the more you get the marriage between archaeology and, and historical research and actually using the ground to inform um, what we write. Um, and actually, that does work as C as well. The, the piece of work I did for television was, was based around marine archaeology and, uh, and the marine archaeology of the Normandy St. Bay area is amazing. Um, as a historian, I know Steve Fisher, who's, who's written a fantastic book on Sword Beach that incorporates as the sites and the ground. So it's that kind of marriage of the history narrative and the battlefield guide, if you like, I think is quite an exciting possibility. Fantastic. Um, some really clear synergies there between each of the responses. We need to go broad, multinational, break down some of the existing stovepipes, both in focus and in methods. Um, so so um, I think that's a good place to end on. Um, we've just gone over the time limit and we've had a number of expressions of thanks in, in the Q&A box. Um, thank you to you free speakers. Um, you've given us a very stimulating evening and thank you to everyone for attending and in particular to those who ask questions. Um, you made this a much richer event. Um, thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. It's a great pleasure to take part. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. My, my pleasure to take part. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.